most descriptions of our community of faith came from Dale one Sunday. He said that this is a community who meets regularly to catch courage from one another. And so we have come together at the dimming of this day to sing and pray courage into each other infusing our bodies and souls with the spirit of the divine courage giver. It's happened before, you know. It happened in another hill country in a region called Judea with two unlikely women. It's a part of the story in Luke that usually does not make it into the Christmas pageants, but it should. You know the story. The angel Gabriel had been making the rounds. One stop was to the old priest Zechariah. And the divine messenger came with the news to get the nursery ready. Because Baron Elizabeth was going to have a baby after all. After all that shame that had been heaped upon her by her community because of her empty womb. After all that resignation, after all those unanswered prayers, after all that time with her aging body, she was carrying new life. And the messenger said, don't be afraid, Zechariah, but he was afraid. So afraid that he couldn't even get a sermon out for nine whole months. He was shocked into silence without any words to name this extraordinary happening. The new was so new that the old words didn't work anymore. And Elizabeth, she found her voice. She thanked God for the gift and her release from the endless years of shame she'd endured from her very own people. Gabriel's next stop was another don't be afraid message given to a young unmarried woman named Mary in a village called Nazareth. He offered the fearful message that she was going to have a baby and he'd be great. Really great. <laughs> great for everybody. <laughs> but Mary was deeply disturbed with the news. Of course she was. It was life-shattering news. Life-changing, turning her world upside down. Favored? How could that be? This seemed like no favor <clears throat> at all. Gabriel also announced that her relative Elizabeth was pregnant. And then he let Mary in on a meditative thought. With God, nothing is impossible. Then he was gone. The same news that released one woman from shame sent another woman into shame. Location is everything. Both were located in the land of vulnerability. It's not easy to be alone with earth-shattering news. Mary knew she needed a friend, so she made her way to visit Elizabeth. Not her fiancé, Joseph, but Elizabeth. She needed to catch some courage from one who not only was in her condition, but who, someone who'd been in the condition of communal shame. So Mary made the journey. Travel was limited. Roads were dangerous. But Mary made her way nonetheless. Mary is a disciple for these times. And when Mary and Elizabeth greeted each other, their surprise paths interlocked, and the invisible life within them was made evident by the quickening of new life in Elizabeth. She knew, she understood, and she welcomed Mary. Women talk. Pregnant women talk. <laughs> about their bodies and their worries and their hopes and their expectations and their excitement. Did they talk about how neither one of them had prayed for these pregnancies? <laughs> Elizabeth had long ago given hope and any prayer for a baby. And Mary was certainly not hoping for one in that time. But God dreamed it up all on her own. How could this be indeed, Mary? 
And if timing is everything, God's was off. Danger was everywhere. It was an anxious making time with the empire of the Romans finding its way all around them. It was a time of King Herod reigning with his terrors. And the power politics reached all the way to Rome. Just to the north of them was Syria, the military headquarters that was readying its weapons to swoop down and seize Jerusalem. In a risky time, in a risky place, in a risky situation, what did Elizabeth and Mary do? They gave each other blessing. That was the first thing. They knew they'd been chosen for something beyond their understanding. They knew that they were vehicles of divine work. In that call, they formed a bond between them. It was a call to form community, an essential ingredient to any daring journey. They affirmed and encouraged each other, and the institutions and culture that claimed and shamed them did not name them. They took their divine name, favored one, and safeguarded it within the treasure chest of their soul. These are the disciples to follow in these times. Then Mary, the adventurous young woman, fierce with hope, seized, for, searched for words to mark this holy moment. What were the songs she'd been taught? What did she remember? What did she know by heart? Mary reached back a thousand years to a singer named Hannah, a once barren woman who held her longed-for baby and sang to God of thanksgiving and praise. And that's the song that welled up from the deepest part of Mary. With some creative changes she made on her own, as we are all meant to do with the songs and stories given to us. It was a revolutionary song. It was a song that had tumbled down to the centuries, a song heard in slave quarters and refugee camps. It was a song sung in prison dungeons and in exiled lands. Mary caught it in her throat and sang it in full force. And then for 2,000 years, this Magnificat has been ra the rallying of hope song, heard on rocky hillsides and in grand cathedrals, a song still chanted by monastics at evensong, mm -hmm. as darkness approaches. It's a song of gratitude, a song of justice and mercy, a song that has breathed life and courage into countless, less favored ones who found favor with God's divine, incarnated ways. New life is coming. Get ready. God's birthing a common vision interlocking our lives, making us interdependent. God's initiating wonder. Mary's words came out, not as future tense, but as past tense. God has shown strength. God has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. God has brought down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up those of low degree. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has. God has. God has. Yes! It's the memory. And God will. And God will. And God will. Slaves made it out of Egypt. Exiles discovered home again. And an unfavorable young woman from a still war-torn and fear-saturated part of the world was favored by God to smuggle hope into this world through her body. And her womb brought forth a baby that transformed her and kick-started a transformation of love that is still changing that our world, this world. 
Somehow her body and soul held the muscle memory of generations, giving her the imagination to open up her life to new possibility, giving her the courage to see soul power growing within her, even as she named the power of God all around her. <coughs> her song provides prenatal class exercises for breathing deeply through the pain and struggles. It reaches past our tiny space and time to see our place in all time with those faithful ones who, in, who have trusted in more than they could see and more than they could understand and more than they could imagine to experience the mystery one who hangs out in delivery rooms, breathing with us to new life. Mary's poetry connected the personal and the political, the individual with the communal, the heart and the mind, the hope and the joy. Mary's song illumines the divine midwife accompanying us in our laboring and breathing courage. You're going to make it. I'm with you. And we're still singing and dancing and birthing with her. Our great temptation is to belittle our contributions, act as if our small little acts don't matter in the great power struggles. Our temptation is to despair and act as if, as if we are alone and powerless. The French philosopher Michael Foucault said, People know what they do. Frequently, they know why they do what they do. But what they don't know is what what they do does. I spent six hours on Wednesday night in an emergency room in New York City. My sister and I had been ice skating with Sydney. And while she was zooming around the rink, Abigail and I skated slowly, cautiously, but capably for women like us. <laughs> Until Abigail got a little, well, zany. <laughs> and she fell. And she broke her wrist. It was not a good time for that. <laughs> Five o'clock traffic in New York City. So instead of taking an ambulance that could have taken a very long time, or a cab, which would have taken longer, we took a cross-town bus to arrive in the waiting room to wait and wait and wait. I told Abigail, she should try screaming with pain like some of the others. So maybe we'd be seen, she'd be seen soon. But no. Instead, Abigail, with the splint on her arm, got busy tidying up the raid waiting room. <laughs> I took over her work while she was getting x-rays. <laughs> and I waited and watched. I saw a doctor and nurse walking through the room of the hurting, checking to see who needed immediate attention. <coughs> Was it the Hasidic Jewish young man limping, or the housekeeper with her employer translating her pain? Was it the young Latino family with a crying baby? Was it the construction worker with his leg ballooning? Was it the elderly Asian couple with a husband pleading for someone to ease his wife's pain? And there were the someones easing the pain of another. And someone listening to a story. Someone holding a crying baby. Someone giving up their seat for another. Someone drying a tear. Someone resetting a broken wrist. And the world was upended. We are in this wounded waiting room together. We offer what we can to ease the burdens, and we still don't know what what we do does. But friends, 
It changes the way the world breathes through the pain to the newness. Jesse, our caller for our dance last week, said that we engaged in all the things that make for good community building last Sunday night. We worked together, prayed together, sang together, ate together, and danced together. Yeah. And we caught courage from each other. And it left us <coughs> with an unusually good feeling of joy. We're catching it all the time if we stay open with rooms of welcome. A Habitat house was built from the Christmas jam music. A young schoolgirl with little English is making cookies with BJ. A difficult third grader is learning to juggle with Kim. A single mother is finding help for her children at the YWCA with Beth. A flooded family in Louisiana has gotten rebuilding help from Buzz and Susie. A traumatized teen is learning resiliency from Stephanie and Suzanne. Five families received food yesterday at their store doorstep anonymously with the boxing up help of our children. And a Cuban church is welcoming strangers from enemy land. We can go on and on. This is the melody we know. This is the song we're singing. This is how we're catching courage. We can't trace all the connecting points. We can't chart the genealogy of courage that ignites us. An unsuspecting woman with a wee baby of love transformed the world. And our creator still likes to work in the dark, in waiting rooms, and in out-of-the-way places swirling together goodness and mercy from generation to generation. So these are the stories we share. This is the melody we sing. This is how we're catching courage, and this is how we dance with joy. For how long? Nine months? Or 900 years? No matter. We're singing our way through. The world is about to turn. For you see, God's still in the birthing room and all's wild with the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.